Uh, one of the uh, difficult, maybe the only difficult thing about lectureship week is uh, getting everybody to sit down when the next section starts. Se session starts, and so it's it's always nice to be able to get up and talk to people, and and uh, that those are really really good times. And so definitely hate to do that, but uh, what we have in store for you next is uh, is uh, is one of those de deals that you'll really enjoy as well. But our next speaker is uh, somebody that. Uh, we all know, uh, so just the quick bio on him, I think he graduated from Freed Hardeman. Uh, he's preached at a couple of different uh, locations, mainly in the, I guess, southeast of Kentucky, West Virginia. But he spent most of his time in Knoxville, Tennessee, and uh, we're very thankful that he and his wife, Kim, are with us again. Uh, they had a really good session this morning, and uh, so we would like to welcome Mr. Steve Higginbotham back to us, who will be preaching on Jesus giving Mary to John. Thank you. Final words are significant. They, they have their their emotion packed. If it's a person that knows they're dying, and uh, those words of Jesus on the cross are packed with emotion. Um, in, in 2010, my dad died, and my mom eventually had to go, and she lived with my my sister in in West Virginia. And then shortly, well, she'd come and visited with us for a few, few months and then went back home. And my mom was unsteady with her uh, walking. And we were always telling her, you know, use that walker, use the cane. She didn't, she didn't want to do that. And uh, so one day my sister called and said that my mom had fallen and that she was taken to the hospital and it was really serious. So we drove up to West Virginia and uh, she had such a severe brain, brain bleed that there was no hope of recovery and if she was able to recover from that she would be completely um, unaware of anything. While we were sitting there literally waiting for her to pass away, I looked at my phone and I had a message from her. I hadn't seen it before in all the hustle and bustle and driving and everything. I had missed it, and it was a call from my mom. And so I played the message, and um, it was her final words. And those words didn't have anything to do with, uh, you know, I, uh, the, the bottom of the lawnmower deck needs cleaned out or, you know, th those kind of things. Uh, the dish towels need to be taken out of the dryer. Uh, though it had nothing to do with that. You don't use your final words that way. Your final words are significant. And her final words were, in essence, I have fallen and it's really bad. And I just wanted to tell you how much I love you. And then she said goodbye. And then she tried to call my sister. But by that time, she was unable to speak. It was just mumbling that uh, after she hung up. But those final words are meaningful. I'll, I'll never forget those final words from my mom. And that's what we have in John, well, the gospel accounts. We have those seven statements from the cross of Jesus that are among his final words while he was here on earth. And they are impactful. And if we have the right mindset, we shouldn't be able to shake those words from our memory. I want you also to know that those final words are not just simply declarations, but they also, well, some of them were said many times. It wasn't just that he made seven statements from the cross. He must have had many things that he said, and the things that he said, that were told that he said, some of them he said more than once. In Luke, you remember Luke recorded that um, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That statement is in the imperfect tense in Greek, and I, I'm, I don't want to get into all that, but it just simply means this. The imperfect tense has reference to an ongoing action that took place in the past. 
And so while Luke was telling about what Jesus said on the cross, it was in the past, but it was something in the past that was ongoing. Jesus didn't just at one occasion while on the cross say, Father, forgive them. But he was saying that over and over again. It was an ongoing thing that he was saying while he was on the cross. But among those sayings of Jesus on the cross was this saying that was spoken to John and to his mother. And if you have your Bible, open it to Luke, uh, John chapter 19 and look with me, verses 25 through 27. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene, and when Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple who he loved, standing by, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her into his own home. This lesson is about meeting emotional needs of people, and, and we see Jesus addressing a need that he knew existed as he was about to die. He's trying to take care of his mother. And I want to give you a, a, about three things from this event, this, the, some factual things that we see from this story, and then I want to give some very practical advice as to how we can minister to people who have needs and who are suffering. The first point I want to bring up just factually is that while Jesus was dying, he was concerned about other people. That's not true of everybody. Some people get so inward focused, it's all about them. I'm the one that's dying. Pay attention to me. Meet my needs. But that's not where Jesus was. He, he lived a more noble life than that. You know, if we could just back off from the event, would we not say, I don't want to be that way when I die. I, I don't want all the focus and attention. I don't want people bowing down and serving me. I would rather die more nobly than that. I know when Kim and I, well, I went to the doctor, I had a nagging pain in my side, and, and I thought it was maybe a gallstone or something like that. And, and you never want to get a call from the doctor after you've been to the doctor. And that's what I got one day. And he said, Steve, man, I, I hate to tell you this, but you have stage four cancer, and you're going to have to get immediate treatment. And uh, I think Kim could hear part of my conversation. I really don't know what I said after that point. Um, but I do remember that when she walked in the room, I told her what he said, and I said, I want to do this well. I, I, you know, and I wanted her help to be able to do this well. I, I assumed at that point stage four cancer to me meant you're dying. And, and I wanted to do it in a way that would bring honor and, and glory to God. And as Jesus is dying, he's not thinking about himself. He's thinking about other people. And so he calls John to the side and says, John, take care of my mom. And he says to his mother, this is now your son. He was meeting her needs. And I, I hope that as we sometimes are in difficult situations, that we can look at Jesus as an example and have that same determination. Man, that is so noble. How can you get outside of yourself when you and your own life is about to be taken from you? Um, but that's the nobility of Christ. And, and I want that to be true of me, and I hope it's true of your life as well. When you come to the end of your life and you know it and you're aware of it as Jesus was, I hope your vision is outward focused, caring for people who are around you and who love you, and not just simply wanting people to minister to you. That's what Jesus was about. Jesus actually was fulfilling the old law that he lived under. In Exodus chapter 20, you remember in verse 12, Jesus said, honor your father and your mother. 
um, for it is, uh, you know, a commandment that it may be well with you and that your days may be long upon the earth. From indications, all indications, it seems that maybe Joseph had already passed away. He, he, he's never mentioned again in the gospel accounts. We read about him being the carpenter's son, but, but we don't see him at the cross. There's no record of him. There's no, you know, Jesus, after the death, Mary is with the disciples. You don't read anything about Joseph with the disciples. It appears that Joseph is gone, and so Mary is alone. And Jesus is concerned about her. And he wants to honor her and fulfill the commandment of God, even as he was in excruciating pain. You know, there are people who think that religion is a farce. There, there was a guy by the name of Jonathan Bethke. I, I don't know if you remember that name or have ever seen, but he was a, a YouTube uh, personality. And he, he did this rap about why I hate religion but love Jesus. Maybe you've seen that. And, and he had millions and millions of views. And uh, he sees religion as being just institutional, cold, sterile, but Jesus, I'm okay with Jesus, but I hate religion. And I hate that that's the view that a lot of people have of religion. And maybe to some extent they're right but it's not the religion of Christ. James chapter 1 and verse 27 says, Pure religion, undefiled before God the Father, is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Sometimes we talk about that verse and we very hurriedly say, now visit doesn't just mean to go see. Uh, it means to meet the needs of, and then we get on to the business of living holy lives. We just give the first part of passing over, and then we spend the rest of our time talking about how we need to be holy people and living right. And uh, I don't know that that's, of course that's important, but God places as much, if not more, emphasis on that first part, visiting the fatherless and the widows in their affliction. I just preached a sermon a couple weeks ago on widows up at Carnes, and, you know, there's this, uh, God called for his people to love and take care of widows, orphans, the poor, and strangers that are in the land over and over again. It was a major theme of the Old Testament prophets. In fact, if you were to guess, how many times did God say, take care of widows and orphans? What, we might say a dozen, two dozen? You want to guess three dozen? How about 83 times? 83 times in Scripture, God stresses, you've got to take care of these people who are vulnerable and who are hurting and who have needs. God is the God of the underdog. He's the God of the oppressed. And he cares for them and calls for us to care for them. And that's what you see Jesus doing from the cross. He's caring for his mother, who is probably a widow, and now she's about to lose her son. Jesus is all about keeping the will of God and honoring him in, in everything that he could do, even while suffering the death that he suffered. The second thing, factually, about this story is the fact that Jesus' mother is present. Have you ever thought about that? I mean, when I think about that, it, it kind of sickens me, really. It, it makes me, I think of my own children, and like, it, how could I have possibly been in the presence of someone who was murdering my son? You know, they, they got him on display. They're nailing nails in his head. How can you stand there and watch that? It wasn't just Jesus who was suffering on that day. His mother was suffering. Those of you who are mothers, you can, you can imagine what it must have been like to have seen that. And not only was, was that, uh, you know, a thing, but 
you know, we have romanticized in our paintings of the crucifixion, we've, we've romanticized that to clean it up just a little bit. The Romans stripped you. They, they didn't allow you to keep a loincloth on like all of our pictures show. It was their practice to completely strip a person and humiliate them as well as cause them to endure such pain. I, just the humiliation of that and, and Mary being present and seeing her son go through all of that, it reminds me, in Luke chapter 2, twice, it's one, one, on one occasion, I think it's about verse 18 or 19, uh, I'm forgetting off the top of my head, but Mary pondered the things that she had heard. She knew her son was special, but as she was learning more and hearing more from the angels and so forth, she, she hid those things away in her heart and pondered those things. And then a little bit later in the chapter, Mary actually is bringing Jesus to the temple to be sanctified. And in verse 35, Simeon, the prophet, is there. And he says of Jesus, the baby, what well, this child is destined for the rise and fall of many people in Israel. Oh, and you, your soul will be pierced. I think it was talking about, he was talking about this. I can't imagine a worse moment in the life of, I know people mistreated Jesus, and I know they wanted to mob around him and kill him a few times, but this had to have been the most horrific thing that Mary ever experienced with relationship to Jesus. And can I take a two-minute digression here? I, I preached a sermon not long ago entitled Mary's First Communion. And I did it for a purpose because, you know, since COVID has happened, uh, the Lord's Supper, I think, has taken the biggest hit during COVID time. We don't spend time. We, we have it all done. We don't even have time to pass the trays. You know how that gave us built-in time to get the trays passed. And, and if yours was anything like it was in, in Knoxville, we would take the bread, and before you could get it swallowed, we were on to the next part and moving on, and very little thought was being done, and I, I kept complaining about it over and over again, that we have to spend more time on the Lord's Supper. We're not, we're not thinking. We don't have time to think. There was a day when Mary took her first Lord's Supper. Have you ever thought about that? She was gathered together on the Lord's Day, and the church is established, and she, as a Christian, would have had that moment when she took the Lord's Supper in memory of her son for the very first time. You know what I see happening, a trend among us? We've got to dim the lights. You know, we have to set the mood to get people to think about Jesus and his death. I, I even knew a congregation that during the Lord's Supper, a guy started walking down the aisle carrying a cross, and, and then people were staged throughout the audience to stand up and yell, crucify him, and, and as if that's supposed to get, that's disruption. That, that's not causing your mind to focus on the death of Jesus. Mary didn't need the lights dimmed to remember the sacrifice of her son. It, it, it's not what we do out here that prepares us to remember the death of Jesus. It's what goes on in here that prepares us to remember Jesus as he commanded us to. I don't think Mary needed any externals because she felt the emotion. And I dare say we will too if we'll get our minds right and remember. And that takes a little time. You know, we may have to slow down a little bit on the Lord's Supper 
and give more time to think and reflect at how horrific this event was and what he accomplished for us at such great price. If we don't have time to do that, we're, we're doing the Lord's Supper wrong. But anyway, Mary was there, and she saw the most horrific thing happen. And then there's these words, and the third factual thing is, is that Jesus said, John, your mother, Mar Mary, your son. In other words, this is your relationship now. John, she's going to be your mom. Mary, he's going to be your son. As a firstborn child, Jesus had the responsibility to his mother caring for her, and um, this is his way of fulfilling that obligation. But have you ever thought, why John? Uh, Jesus was not an only child. He had brothers. Do you remember in Matthew chapter 13 and verse 55, he had James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? Why wouldn't he just hand them off to them? I mean, that, that, that's kind of weird, isn't it? I mean, like if, if you're... If, if, when when my, my dad passed away, can you imagine me giving my mother to somebody else and, and my sister and I didn't care for her? Uh, you know, you don't, you don't give them away to somebody out of the family. So why did Jesus give Mary to John when he had brothers and sisters who could have cared for her? I think that's a good question. And I don't know for a fact that this is the reason, but I believe it is. When you read in John chapter 7 and verse 5, Jesus' brothers were unbelievers. They didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah, the Son of God. In fact, on occasion, those who knew him, and sometimes it's debated uh, whether or not this is his close friends or his family uh, by the, the, the Greek word that's used, but at one occasion, they thought he was out of his mind. They came to get him because he was just obviously crazy thinking he's the son of God. But his brothers didn't believe. And that speaks volumes to me. Have you ever heard the expression, blood is thicker than water? I think the opposite's true. The waters of baptism are thicker than blood. Spiritual family is thicker than physical family. Mary had physical family, but they were unbelievers. Jesus is not going to turn her over to those brothers of his as they were unbelievers. He's going to turn her over to somebody who can help her maintain her path to heaven. We really need to learn to love the body of Christ, our family, more than what we do. This body of people here and everywhere should have bonds and ties that are even greater than our family ties. And if you think that's strange, it's nothing different than what Jesus taught in his personal ministry. Do you remember what he said in Matthew chapter 10? Uh, I didn't come to bring uh, peace on earth. Uh, listen, your own family will become your enemies. A and you, you've got to have a greater love for me than for your mom and dad and for your children. And if you don't, and this is strong, you're not worthy to be my disciple. Those are powerful, strong words. You mean, Jesus, if I love my family more than you and, and my spiritual family? Yes, you're not worthy of being his disciple. Those are strong words. But I think that's why Jesus turned Mary over to John. Because John was a believer, and Jesus recognized the importance He's not just concerned about how his mom does for the next 25 or 30 years. He's concerned about how her mom is going to do in eternity. That was his greatest concern. And so he turned her over to somebody who would see to that while her, his brothers were still unbelievers. Now, those brothers changed their mind. 
and I think it was the event of the resurrection that did it. I mean, that is the ultimate thing that happened, the, the exhibit of God's power and his deity and, and the, the person of Jesus. When that tomb is opened and Jesus rises again and shows himself for 40 days to people who knew he had been crucified, that was the kicker. How could you then say, you're not who you said you are? And so then we see James and Joseph, uh, James and Judas uh, among the disciples, among the believers after that point. And they later wrote, I believe, wrote the books of James and the book of Jude in our Bibles. But those are the facts. But I want us now to look at, okay, I see what Jesus did from the cross. It's his final words. These mean a lot. I, he wasn't focused on himself. He was willing to think about others in the midst of his own trouble. And, and his mother had endured a horrible loss, horrific I can't imagine watching your own child be slowly murdered. And so he prepares for her and says, John, take care of her. So how can we be like Jesus and help people who have experienced horrific things? Who are suffering in this life, maybe their husband, their wife, their children, have been taken from them, and they are hurting. What can we do? Let me give you some examples that I think will help you be Christ-like as he was on the cross. And the first thing is this. Don't avoid them. Include them. You know that uh, a survey was done among widows, and one of the things that was the most regrettable for them is that they lost all their friends when their spouse died. 75% of widows said, we lost friends. And how that probably happens is not intentional, but it's just people not knowing how to react to somebody who's suffering. Like, man, we're having couples over after church. It's kind of awkward to ask. I don't want her to feel bad if we ask her. And so we just, we don't ask. Or maybe there was a time when we would ask and try to include them, but she wasn't up to it yet. It was too much for her. And so she would decline. And maybe you asked her a couple times, and she would, de would, de would decline because she wasn't there yet. But we took it as an eternal answer. And so we never ask them again. We need to include those who are suffering. Don't run from them. When I teach on grief and suffering and how to minister to people in congregations that are, are going through that, one of the questions that I invariably get is this question. I don't know what to say. I don't know, like, I, I don't know what to say to people. Like, I, you know how you walk down and you walk past the casket and you speak? I, I can't bring myself to do that because I don't know what to say to the person. And there are people that will literally avoid because they don't know what to say. Can I tell you, you don't have to say anything. Just say you're sorry. Just say, I love you. Just say, you're in my prayers. You don't have to have words to fix anything because you can't fix that. You don't need to be pithy and, and witty and, and have some, you know, really wise statement to give. Just let them know that you're sorry. And that's all you have to say. And that is far better than avoiding them and making them feel like they're all alone. Another thing that you can do is show continual compassion and care. We're really good, and I'm sure you are too, but we're really good at when somebody dies in the congregation, man, whoosh, 
we are there. We activate the food group. We activate the prayer chain. We, we are just, we smother them with love and attention and care and service all the way through the, the funeral. We have people that will stay at the house while you're at the funeral because there are crazy people in the world that prey on people that are away for funerals and rob their houses and that. We have people that will do that. We have people that will prepare meals for the entire family, extended family, at the church building as soon as the funeral is over and give them a place where they can all be together and just grieve and reminisce and all those kind of things. We're really good at the funeral and ministering. But then here's what happens. The funeral is over. And we all go back to our normal life. Well, everyone except for the one who lost a loved one. Life is not the same for them anymore. It's hard. They're lonely. And we're thinking, well, the funeral was over and we did a really good job at ministering to them. They need continued care. They need continued compassion. And, and don't let the funeral be the end of your compassion because it's just the beginning of their suffering. One of the specific things that you can do, and I tell the guys in my, I had to teach a preacher in his work class and these preaching students, I tell them, you got a smartphone, use it for the glory of God and not the foolishness that sometimes we, we waste time on. If somebody dies in your congregation, open up your calendar and set the date so that a year from now, you can write that person a note or go by their house and just say, hey, I know it's been a year and I know that you're hurting today and I just want to tell you I haven't forgotten your spouse and I love you and I know it's a hard day for you and if there's anything I can do, you know, what, what, what can I do and how can I help you? Just, just uh, a couple weeks ago was 10 years, um, the anniversary of my dad's death. There was a lady at church, came up to me. Actually, we were at a funeral at a cemetery. And she came up to me and she said, I just want you to know I'm thinking about you today and, and the fact that your dad died 10 years ago today. That was meaningful. Like, wow, I'm not the only one thinking about that. There are other people who are thinking about that too. We all have those abilities with our smartphones. We don't have to say, oh, I forgot. We can just put it in there. And then those anniversaries, you know that person who suffered the loss, that will be all that is on their mind on that day. And to get a message from you to say, I'm right there with you. I miss them too. I'm still there. I'm praying for you today. I know it's hard. That means the world to people. That's that continual care that we have to give. And that's what Jesus was doing. Jesus isn't just trying to get Mary through this gruesome death, but ongoing care from someone who would take her under his wing. We need to avoid platitudes. I, there was a lady on one occasion, <laughs> I have to tell you this story because it's a Providence story. But her husband, when before they were married, he was searching for the truth, but he had not found it. He was not a Christian, but he was looking. And he said, he told me this story. He said, I, it was World War II, and he said, I was hunkered down in this bush. I was laying down, and I saw a German soldier go in front of me. And I shot him, but I hit him in the leg. And he spun around and shot into that bush that I was in, and the bullet went in my shoulder and traveled down my back and came out at the base of my spine, and I couldn't move. I was paralyzed. And that German soldier came up to me and picked me up and carried me for more than a mile. And he said, I look back at that, and I can't help but think that was God's providence. I would have been lost to a devil's hell if he would have killed me because I was not a Christian. But 
because of that man that I just shot had compassion on me, I was able to get well in a German hospital and eventually released, and he met this woman who was a Christian, and, and he was a faithful member all the way up until the day of his death. Well, I went to her house when I heard that James had passed away, and I was sitting on the couch, and I was just listening. She was talking 90 mile an hour, telling me stories. I mean, you don't have to say anything. Just be there. Let them talk. Listen. And she was talking and talking, and then eventually a woman came in with food. And she said, where would you like, to take, where would you like for me to take this? And she said, just put it on in the kitchen. And, and so as this woman walked by, she reached down and touched her on her shoulder and said, honey, I am so sorry. I understand just what you're going through. I lost my husband too. Man, that woman about raised the roof. She screamed with all of her power, you have no idea what I'm going through. You have no idea. And you know, she's right. Just because you lost somebody doesn't mean that you felt the same way. Somebody can be much closer. Somebody could have a cool relationship with somebody else. Same relationship, but different feelings within that relationship. Those kinds of statements, and should she have gone off like that? Well, of course not. But people who are hurting, well, you've heard the expression, hurt people hurt people. And, and she was hurting, and she's on edge, and she just went off on that woman, woman because of that calloused remark. She didn't understand how she fe felt. Rather than saying things like that, why don't you say something that's more honest? I'm sorry. I'm praying for you. Nobody's going to object to those kind of words. And, and those platitudes, and Eric mentioned, you know, like, well, you know, at least he's in heaven. That's not helpful in that moment. That person has lost a loved one. I, 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 ha I remember a time when a, a young boy died and people were saying, is God's will. Those kind of things can be, can be devastating to a person's faith. Be careful. Avoid platitudes and speak truth, things that you know. And I can, I can tell you with assurance, I am sorry. And I can tell you, I'm going to pray for you. And I can tell you, I love you. And, and just leave it at that. And, and avoid those things that actually eat at people. And, and then be a good listener. Let people talk. You don't have to say. You can just sit and be quiet, and your presence says that you love them and are concerned for them. Job's friends did that. They, they for a while, just sat and were silent with Job. And sometimes I'll go to a house with somebody who passed away, and I'll just sit there. And that's all I do is I just sit there until it's time to leave and and, and I'll pray with them, uh, usually give them scriptures on a card because I don't want to read the Bible, and they're probably at that moment, and they're probably not in a mind to, to get it. But there will be a time later in the day, maybe in the middle of the night, when they're wide awake and everybody else is asleep, that they might want to read those passages of comfort um, at their own pace. And so I leave them a card with some passages to read a little bit later. But be a good listener. And do this. Be willing to talk about uncomfortable things. Don't control their conversations. Don't say, now don't say that. Don't go there. I remember a man that was dying in the hospital. And, and I came to visit him. And his whole family was in there. And he pulled me down real close. And he said, tell everyone in here to get out except for you. And so I said, um, Jim would like everybody to leave the room for just a minute. And so they all left, and he said, I know I'm dying, and I need to talk about it, but I can't with them, because every time I bring up the subject, they say, no, 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 Daddy, you're going to be okay. We're not going down that road. We're not talking about that. And that's what he needed to talk about. 
and they wouldn't let them. You may have to listen to people have some very difficult conversations because that's what they need to, to find peace and, and uh, resolution. And so be willing to listen and talk about uh, uncomfortable topics as a way of ministering to their, their uh, emotional needs. And then one final thought, and it's this. As we're bustling around, preparing, you know, casserole dishes and, and, you know, taking care of everything that we take care of, will somebody meet their spiritual needs? I know you got meals for two weeks sitting in your refrigerator, but wouldn't it be nice if somebody went by and just said, can we pray? Can, can I pray for you at this moment? Can we read the Bible together? You know, there was a lady who told me, I used to teach a, a ladies class every Thursday for 20 years, and uh, it was 11 o'clock on Thursday morning, and um, I, I did a, uh, a, a series on death, death and dying. Boy, they didn't like that. It was senior ladies, and they said, don't ever teach that again. That was so depressing, but, and it probably was. But one of the things that one of the ladies said in that, she said, you know the hardest thing when my husband died is that somebody came and tried to be helpful and wouldn't let me have a moment to myself. I couldn't get her out of my hair. She was doing this and doing this and doing this, and I, I just wanted to be alone and to grieve. Every time she caught me crying, she'd tell me to stop. And, and that was her biggest challenge. But wouldn't it be nice to have people that would just call her up and say, can I pray with you just for a minute? I'm thinking about you. I, I know you're still hurting. Who would say no to that? And how would that not lift that person's spirits? We had a church secretary at Carnes. I hope she never listens to this, but she was not skilled. Uh, I'll say it that way. My office was just off of her office, and, and sometimes you would hear, I would hear this going on. Ugh, ugh, I hate computers. And it would just be that. And finally I would get up and I'd say, what, what's the matter? And she said, it won't work. This computer's broken. And I'd walk over and I'd push the on button and I'd turn around and go back to my, my office. It was things like that. One day I heard her uh, and, and, and I, I came in and she said, this mouse, this stupid mouse won't work. And I said, well, let me see. And she put her hand off. The mouse was literally upside down in her hand. She was using it like that and it wasn't working. I just reached, flipped it over and went back to my office. That's, that, that, was, that was what she could do. But I, Well, maybe that's what she couldn't do, but let me tell you what she could do. People call the building all the time saying, my nephew's having surgery, my husband just had a heart attack, so-and-so just went into the hospital. And I could hear her from my office say, before we hang up, can I pray for you? Can I pray for your nephew? And she would lead that person, uh, women, she would lead them in, in prayer, always. I didn't care if she couldn't use her computer. There was nobody better than to pick up the phone and, and talk to people who were hurting than this woman because she was meeting the spiritual needs of people. From the cross of Christ, I, I'm so thankful that we have this exchange recorded for us. I don't doubt that there are many, many other things that maybe Jesus said during those six hours that he hung on the cross, but I am glad that those words are preserved for us. John, this is your mother. Mary, this is your son. Because in those words, I see the care that Jesus had for the needs of his mother. 
and I just want us to learn from him and love each other and be there for them. And I'll tell you, that's one of the great things about being a child of God. You have this family. We are family. And, and when I hurt, you hurt, and you pray for us. And, and uh, you know, those things take place on a day. De- they're routine. This family, according to Jesus, while on the cross, is more important than your physical family. I believe that's why Jesus gave her to John. And if you're here tonight and you're not yet a part of God's family, by confessing your faith in Jesus and turning from your sins and being baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, if you will do that, you will be added to the family of God. And as a part of that family, you will have people that will love you and support you and lift you up when you have fallen for the rest of your life. There's nowhere better to be in this world than in the family of God. And if you need that, we'll assist you in your obedience to the gospel. And if you're a child of God already but unfaithful, we don't know how long we have. We, we um, you know, life is but a vapor and you may have plans. In fact, I often think, how many people, when Jesus comes again, will be good people that intended to get right, but he got there before they got right? There will be countless people who are lost because they waited too long. And if you know you need to get rid of some sins, I I want you to remember one thing. In Micah chapter 7, verse 18, who is a God like you? Micah said, pardoning the iniquities of the remnant of his people and um, forgiving our sins. He's a God who delights in mercy. Why would you leave here tonight lost when you serve a God who delights, doesn't have to, but he loves it to be merciful to you? If you need to respond, we invite you to come as we stand together and sing. gates of light if the way of the cross I miss the way of the cross leads home the way of the cross leads home it is sweet to know as I onward go cross leads home. Then I bid farewell to the way of the world, to walk in it nevermore. For my Lord says, come, and I seek my home, where he waits at the open door. The way of the cross leads home. The way of the cross leads home. It is sweet to know as I onward go. The way of the cross leads home. Steve, we want to thank you for a uh, powerful and thought-provoking and challenging and applicable in difficult times lesson that you gave us tonight. We want to uh, say that how much we appreciate both you and Kim being here and Eric and Vanessa as well. Thank you guys for coming. All four of you got all four of you are very special to us, and we want to make sure that we pass that on to you. If you like what you heard tonight, come back tomorrow. Uh, both Eric and Steve will be back with us. So uh, we'll be back here at 6 and 7 tomorrow, but we also have the uh, 1030 session as well, where we'll have a panel discussion um, as well. So please make plans to attend. Thank you.
you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we're so thankful to be here together tonight. Father, we're, we're, we're thankful for the opportunity and the freedom we all have to be here as, as brothers and sisters, as a family, to worship you and your son and to hear these good lessons from these good men and women, Father. We thank you so much for, for Eric and Vanessa and, and for Steve and Kim and, and for their wisdom, but, but most of all, Father, for their, for their love for you and for your people. We, we, we are truly blessed to know them and to have them in our lives and, and just to get this opportunity to hear their wisdom and their perspective, Father. We hope that the lessons, not just from them, but everyone that has brought a lesson to us, we, we, we hope we take it out in this world with us, Father, and remember to be lights out in this world, to, to, to lift those up around us, to, to just always try to, to live a life that lets people know we live for you and we live for your son, Father. As we leave this evening, we ask you to be with everyone around this world that's going through any strife and struggles, Father, and, and just let them always know that they can find their peace and their, their comfort in you. As we leave tonight, just be with all of us. Keep us safe in our travels, Father. We hope that we all get an opportunity to be here together again. We thank you. We thank you also, Father, for our visitors that are here with us, Father. We hope that they feel welcome and, and feel at home here and, and that, that they know that we're honored to have them here with us, Father. Once again, we ask you for everything you do for us each and every day, Father. Thank you most of all for your son, for the life he lived for us and the life he ultimately gave for us on the cross. We, we hope that, once again, we are always doing things that make you proud of us as your children and lift you up in everything we do. We ask you to forgive us when we fall short, and we ask this in Christ's name. 